Ladies and gentlemen, we are not so really complete, it seems to me, uh, but I think uh, we should start because we have limited time and this limitation is connected with the limitation of our uh, symposium at all. Uh, and so it could be that uh, one or the other uh, will leave during uh, our discussion because the train or plane uh, is going. <coughs> we uh, have the final session, um, I would say, about the future uh, of the past. Um, and <coughs> this is um, not so easy to describe uh, because uh, we had that challenge of uh, that 100 years um, looking back and the question is why do we look back and um, are there lessons learned that was a question in the last um, panel there was another question about uh, the question of common remembrance or in which way that can be done uh, on the European level. Uh, I think during our panel we will come back to this or the other question too, but we should start um, with that anniversary which will take place um, this year in uh, a lot of European countries, including Romania, uh, and Poland, both countries who are very strong represented here during our uh, symposium. And uh, in both of these countries, but others too, the Baltic states and so on, uh, there are preparations about that uh, 100 years uh, anniversary. I personally uh, <coughs> was uh, last year looking to that in a, with some doubt, what does it mean for us in Europe if so many states will have their anniversary and celebration? Will it, in the end, uh, come to a new wave of nationalism in Europe? Uh, and so the question is, in which way uh, this can be combined, uh, that views, or are there other perspectives which could be important for uh, our common or not common remembrance. Um, so um, we have uh, with us uh, two important personalities uh, who have um, a long experience uh, from different perspectives. Um, Professor David Reynolds, uh, coming from Cambridge, but um, very often in his life, he's very connected with uh, the scientific life as historian uh, in the transatlantic sphere, uh, many positions in the United States, uh, and he wrote a book about the long shadows uh, of the First uh, World War, uh, and so exactly that is the question. Uh, we deal with, and so he's, uh, you could say, the born panelist uh, for that uh, panel. Um, Michael uh, Zantowski, um, having a quite different background uh, as a diplomat, uh, as growing up uh, in a communist country uh, in which um, the circumstances pushed him to do some things, uh, to be not only an author, but um, part of uh, the dissident uh, activities, um, being a spokesman, being uh, in relationship with uh, the country ab abroad, being a bridge uh, between Czechs in the country and um, outside, uh, and he uh, has a lot of experience in that time being a good uh, friend of Václav Havel, writing a very famous biography uh, about him. And so uh, he now is 
the director of the Václav Havel Library, uh, and I can't tell you more about the, this positions because it's better you tell us about your um, positions, not as a, in the institutions, but uh, in our common dialogue. I myself uh, come from Germany. I am involved in the uh, network as the chairman of the um, advisory board. Um, <coughs> and Professor uh, Reynolds, uh, we agreed that you could start um, with that question uh, combining the question of ind independency with questions of uh, international limits, which from the beginning uh, played an important role uh, in the protection of minorities, for instance. Can you start, please? There is a microphone. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be in a, a conference where we're taking very different national perspectives, sharing them, thinking about them, and also different perspectives from our own experience. I come at this from the perspective as an academic historian who thinks that history is far too important to be left to the historians. Uh, we've got people here who've been engaged in politics, in cultural affairs, diplomacy, museums, and so there's a sharing of our different experiences of the past in the present. On your question about independence, um, we got onto this in the last session. Uh, 1918 is commemorated in different ways. In Many of the Western countries, certainly for Britain and for France, it is simply the end of the war, the end of La Grande Guerre, the Great War. Uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, in the Baltic states, it is the coming of independence. It is the moment when independence is achieved from uh, the, the crucible of this bitter and bloody struggle. And historically, from in the story of European history, this is one of the great breaking apart moments, 1918, 17, 1917, 1918. The breaking apart of great empires that had shaped the destiny of Central, Eastern, Southeastern Europe for centuries. Uh, of the Romanov Empire uh, in 1917, uh, and then the Hohenzollern, uh, Habsburg, and uh, Ottoman empires at the, in the autumn of 1918. And the fallout from those, the collapse of those great empires has shaped much of the, the 20th century. Um, the one addendum to that is, of course, that the Russian empire was reinvented under different leadership and with much uh, more truncated borders uh, under Bolshevik leadership and that in a sense shaped the whole period of not only Russia but eventually of Eastern Europe from um, uh, 1917 uh, to 1991. So the breakup of empires, independence movements are uh, fighting for independence and also engaging in the diplomacy of independence at the Paris Peace Conference, lobbying for their own uh, nation state, uh, uh, a whole group of, of countries, ones that are familiar to us, Masaryk and the Czechs, uh, Poland, uh, uh, but also countries or groups that have still not established uh, independence. The Kurds, for example. The Kurds are a major lobby in 1919 for a Kurdish state. Ukrainians were as well. Um, uh, 
Uh, again, uh, that, in that case, uh, an independence that was not achieved till 1991. So it's a complicated story. Um, but it's built around the slogan of self-determination. Self-determination, a phrase that I think Lenin starts, kicks into use, Woodrow Wilson picks up and becomes one of the uh, slogans that he popularizes. The problem was actually, if you like, to discover what that self was in any particular case. Wilson said, as the Paris Peace Conference went on, that he was astonished to discover how many national groups there were lobbying for self-determination. He said, I never knew there were so many countries, uh, as it were, in, in incubation. And on one occasion, his, um, his wife came into one of the, um, the conferences of the, 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 um, the senior leaders uh, in one of the Grand Salons in Paris and found them all on the floor, on their knees, on their hands and knees, poring over a huge map. And she said to him, you look like little boys playing a game. And she, he looked up at her and he said, it is a game that is the most serious in the world. In other words, they were trying to decide national boundaries. Knowing nothing, certainly in Wilson's case and Lloyd George's case, uh, about the regions involved. Uh, and knowing they had to do it against a timeline, the clock was ticking, and having to make decisions that would settle the fate of not just nations but human beings, drawing lines on a map. Um, so the problem was to try and work out what is the self that you are trying to recognize in this particular area. And most of the states that came into existence and were recognized at the Paris Peace Conference were multinational states with a particular national or ethnic group in the superior position. And that meant that there was in most cases going to be a problem of minorities and minority rights. Uh, and most of them also had contested borders, borders that were not agreed with their neighbors, borders that, that were arbitrary. I once went to what was uh, in the 19th uh, the Great War, the, the Grand Duchy of Teshen, um, and that was the source of, uh, of fighting and conflict in 1918, 1919, and eventually the people at the Paris Peace Conference arbitrarily decided to divide the city down the middle between Czechoslovakia and Poland. And uh, I stood on the bridge where it is the, in the middle of the town, which is the border between Poland and Czechoslovakia, or Czech, the Czech Republic as it became. So that was one example to me, and it was a very vivid one, of, of the human consequences of, of this process of deciding about dividing countries and creating countries. Um, and of course, it, who is the self is not just a question for Europe. If you think of a, an issue that's now on our agenda in a big way, uh, just because of the commemorations in the Middle East, uh, the mandate for Palestine that was given to the British government, that was for uh, preparing this region, this, this, this area, for self-determination. And the British never came to grips, it's not clear who could have come to grips, with the problem of what was the self you were talking about here, how you accommodated Jews, Palestinians, in uh, and the recognition for their rights. So self-determination was not just a problem for Europe, it was a problem for elsewhere as well. But in terms of what was um, achieved, there was uh, a division, a, 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 a map created of Europe, in some cases contested, so for example the borders between Poland and Russia uh, are the subject of, of war, 
uh, afterwards, 1920, 1921. Many of the Baltic states, the same. There's a fight, fighting until independence is achieved. But there is then a situation where you have a, uh, the establishment of governments with a, an explicit recognition of minority rights but minority rights that can't be effectively enforced. And that creates many of the problems that become serious diplomatic issues in the 1920, 1930s, um, uh, not least in, in Czechoslovakia itself. Maybe I should stop there and we can carry on. Yeah, thank you very much for that <coughs> overview. Czechoslovakia was one of these states Uh, which uh, were established and <coughs> the later president then uh, played a marvelous role uh, to prepare it and it is very interesting that <coughs> the start of this new states not only but also that these states became democracies um, was quite interesting I think for us and this Uh, it was important and the United States played from the beginning an important role in that field. Uh, I think this is an issue which is a uh, continuing uh, question for the whole century. Uh, Michael, can you give us a short introduction in your special case but with that transparent to challenges? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, I don't know about short introduction, but I'll get to it. With an hour. It will be briefer than that. Uh, but first of all, thank you for inviting me and for having me here. I feel slightly out of place uh, because I'm not a historian. Um, uh, I spent the first 10 years of my career in a, in a mental institution and that's still my perspective, I'm afraid. So uh, if uh, much of what I'll say will differ from what you've heard before, I, I apologize beforehand. And before I get to the question of independence in Czechoslovakia, I, I must uh, refer to the broader context of this conference and to the previous uh, panel because the context is, is very important for, for me. First of all, This session is called in the program Future Overlooking the Past, which I think is a terrible idea. It uh, implies that uh, the future somehow lords it over the past, that the past is uh, uh, something like a, a museum display on the glass that we can overlook uh, while we know both in psychology and in politics and in, in life that Uh, the past has this very strange habit of coming back at you at uh, the most unexpected moments and playing tricks on you and uh, changing your perspectives and uh, and I think we should uh, we should be used to working with this uh, notion of the past as a as a living thing I mean in the communist regime uh, you know we we used to say that It was the future that was certain, and it was the past that was changing all the time. It's uh, it's uh, it's not quite like that, but uh, but we should be we should be careful. The second uh, uh, comment I want to make is uh, because it it's directly linked to our region and to how we experience the f legacy of the First World War and what came after. That was uh, whether. Uh, the war was a catastrophe or, or not uh, uh, and there were some differing opinions on that on the previous panel but obviously it was both I mean most uh, Czech uh, men in the period uh, of, of military age were drafted and went through the hardships and uh, and starvation and uh, and uh, many of them died uh, of the war and the population at large was suffered from hunger and uh, 
and, and disease, etc., etc. And from, from the human point of view, as any large war is, it obviously was a catastrophe. From a political point of view, it ended in uh, something that was appreciated by most of the people in the, in the country, namely uh, the, the independence that we're talking about. But uh, we should not forget about this dual nature of the experience, and maybe that's one of the reasons why, unlike in other countries, in my country, uh, the, much of the legacy of the First World War is somehow skirted around. I mean, it's not a matter of uh, large commemorations. Uh, uh, there are, uh, if there are grave uh, memorials, etc., they are on the local level, etc., etc. The independence is the big thing, and as it comes to a centenary in, in October, it will be lavishly celebrated, um, uh, I'm sure. But uh, the Czech role in the First World War was uh, uh, somehow limited, and I think the two most important contributions we've made uh, to the war was, uh, first we provided the first victims, uh, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife Sofia were uh, living 20 kilometers from Prague and Sofia Chotek was, uh, was a Czech uh, noblewoman uh, who, who got killed with her husband in, in Sarajevo. And the second major contribution we made to the war is the fictional figure of uh, uh, the good soldier Schweik. And uh, uh, a, a moron uh, an officially uh, uh, credited moron who somehow uh, manages to sabotage and undermine the Austrian-Hungarian war effort and contribute to uh, the defeat of the empire in, in the war in his uh, uh, inimitable way. And uh, and, and again, there is a, a very ambivalent uh, uh, relationship in the history of the country and of its letters and art and novels and even politics uh, about the uh, identification with the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and the longing for, for independence. And it's best illustrated on Masaryk, Thomas Garrick Masaryk himself, who actually started his political life as what used to be called the Austroslavist, uh, meaning a, 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 a Czech politician aiming for more autonomy within the framework of the empire and ended up uh, by being a leader of the movement for uh, independence and actively organizing the Czech military resistance, uh, including the legions in the uh, in 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 Russia towards uh, uh, towards that end, and uh, and the very idea of the independence as a fight in the law of the times against the prison of the nations, which was the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, was uh, slightly ironic. I mean, by the end of uh, the 19th century, if uh, it were a prison, it was a if it was a minimum security prison, and uh, and uh, and the Czechs were doing, uh, apart from their political representation, they were doing quite well in the empire. But still, with uh, the American help. Uh, with President Wilson's help and the 14 articles and the role of the legions in Russia and the Versailles Conference, uh, the independence came about and produced in miniature a, a replica of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, a, a multi-national, uh, uh, multicultural country uh, uh, with a Czech uh, majority, a uh, uh, Slovak one set of the population, 20% uh, 
German population, uh, seven to eight percent Hungarian population, and uh, a, a large number of uh, Jews who uh, identify themselves sometimes as Czechs, sometimes as Hungarians, and uh, uh, sometimes differently. I've had it said in Israel that uh, you know in former Czechoslovakia there were uh, Czechs, uh, then there were Slovaks and Hungarians and Germans, and then there were Czechoslovaks, and those were the Jews. And so, <laughs> uh, so it's uh, it's a, it's a very very interesting history. But the truth is that for the next twenty years, it managed to become and remain uh, the only working democracy in 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 the region. And with the rise of Nazism in in Germany and uh, authoritarian regimes in other countries, it it became also a, a refuge for many uh, many political refugees and and Democrats from from those countries. But it uh, it did not last. Uh, I I have things to say on on the principle of independence and self determination. As such, but maybe it, I, I won't be long. It, uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, international law, uh, uh, the principle of self-determination represents a stage in a continuing uh, uh, development of the idea of uh, international relations. It. The original idea, as, uh, uh, which existed for close to 300 years, was the Westphalian system uh, idea stemming from the uh, from the Thirty Year War, and uh, and ended by the Westphalian uh, Agreement in 1648. And the core of those principles was the principle of sovereignty. Uh, uh, of a state and of non-interference in the internal affairs of uh, any state of the system. But those were the times when the states were still largely based on dynastic principles and in part on religious principles which contributed to the Thirty's War, of course. Uh, the principle of uh, self-determination did not come with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, First World War and with 1918. It actually uh, uh, became a practice avant la lettre uh, in the 19th century with the self-determination of big European nations the Germans and and the Italians. You know, they actually claimed, you know, the right to uh, become uh, sovereign uh, uh, nations uh, based on on ethnicity and on on blood and land and uh, language and uh, and uh, the independence of smaller European nations in 1918 came as a second wave. Of uh, of that trend, uh, but followed upon what did happen in the in the mid uh, mid nineteenth century. Now, of course, today both principles, the principle of uh, of sovereignty and non interference, and the principle of self determination, they are both enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, 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 without uh, the charter stating which takes precedence in 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 which situation, which is one of the uh, one of the sources of conflicts and and uh, etc. But it it's not the end of the development. I mean, the Helsinki uh, document in 1975 comes with another principle, the principle of human rights which are for the first time considered a, a legitimate reason to interfere uh, 
in the internal affairs of other countries of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the document. And last sentence, it does not end with that. In the 1990s and early in this century, we have the still contested principle of humanitarian intervention or as we now sometimes call it the R2P, the right to protect uh, uh, principle that is, has been also invoked as a legitimate reason to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. So you can see that the ground is still shifting. I think um, you made really a long uh, line and I will come back because uh, it, but we will come back to that concrete too because if we look to that time at the end of the First World War, um, one year before uh, the Americans came in very late uh, in the First World War. They didn't want in the beginning, uh, but because of the crazy Germans and the U-boat um, uh, strategy, uh, they forced really <laughs> the Americans to come in. And uh, in my view, you can uh, respond if it's right. The Americans were the f only nation in the whole uh, First World War who came in with an aim, with a political aim. Um, um, you can call it ideology. The, all the others fought for their own power, to increase their own power. The Americans came in uh, fighting the, for self-determinance and democracy. Uh, that is it, what they said. Um, and in the same year, we had the so-called October Revolution, uh, revolution, the coup d'etat of Lenin um, in Russia in that time. Uh, later the establishment of Soviet Union. From that time, for Europe, there was for one century the alternative between democracy and ideologic totalitarianism. I think this is an important issue which belongs to that question of the end of the war. And then the establishment of the new states was combined not only with the question of national sovereignty, but it was mentioned before that these states in the same way became their limitations, limitations of that national sovereignty, for instance, with the questions of minority rights. The question of international law and international institutions became in the same moment, the establishment of the League of Nations. I think this is a linkage uh, which for the whole century and even today, you mentioned the question of law, of international law, that on the one hand, democracies were established with the rule of law, and on the other hand, in the international way, not only new states came in, but also in the international framework with an international law and international institutions, which were weak at that time, but which were very important from the strategy point of view. Uh, could you agree with that description or what would you give as your message? <coughs> Uh, well, you covered a, a, a huge number of things. Let me start with the question of, of the United States, because that, I think, speaks, as you said, to a theme that runs across the, the whole period we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson did not bring his country into the war in 1914. He believed that as a, <clears throat> a country of immigrants, to enter the war would be almost to open up a civil war within the United States because there were obviously people of British stock, there were people of German stock, Irish stock who did not want to uh, participate on the British side. Uh, 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 for people from uh, the Balkans, the idea of entering a war that the Russians were part of the alliance, that was uh, uh, you know, abhorrent and so on. <clears throat> so neutrality was actually the most sensible political thing for him to do. 
particularly if he could also have the benefit of what were called neutral rights. In other words, that you'd, you are not in the war, but you trade as freely as you can with all the belligerents. That was the policy, um, to profit from Europe's wars, which was an American tradition. Um, the reality was that, of course, because of the connections, the economic connections were much more strong with London and, to a lesser extent, Paris than Berlin, it ended up that the United States' trade was largely with the British. And that created a situation for Germany that was one that clearly, if you like, biased American neutrality against the central powers, against Germany and the Habsburg Empire. And so the resort to U-boat warfare, unrestricted U-boat warfare in 1917, was a hard-headed realpolitik decision by Ludendorff that this was the only way to break the Allied cause, to cut the lifeline between the United States and Western Europe. Um, uh, so America's neutrality was in a sense biased and uh, Ludendorff was responding to that in a, a way that was uh, understandable, if not you know, acceptable. Wilson, for my money, is, is in a situation where he has no choice in the spring of 1917 but to take his country into war. Uh, I have a lower view of Wilson than you do. I think no government stands up and says, I kind of made a mess of this earlier on. I should have thought through more carefully what our neutrality policy was like, uh, but we're going to have to enter the war now. No, no politician does that. He's, he, he goes for the high ground and he says, we are going to this war for no selfish interests. We are going uh, to establish some kind of new world order. Uh, so he puts it on a level of morality. Having said that, it's true the United States has less at stake than the British or the French. And Wilson is very keen to say the United States is an associate power not an allied power. In other words, the US associates with the Europe, the Britain and France for the purposes of defeating German militarism. But Wilson's larger agenda is that he wants to change the militarism and imperialism that he sees as endemic in the whole of Europe. And that is, in a sense, where the agenda is, is more broad. Um, the problem is that that really grand agenda of changing the fabric of European politics does not square with American self-interest because the big problem over the whole course of the 20th century is that on the whole, the, the Europeans have felt they needed America more than America needs Europe there is an imbalance in the relationship. And that's why American leaders very often have gone onto the moral plane to justify interventions in Europe that do not make a lot of sense if you live in Illinois or Nebraska or whatever. Um, and that has been one of the big problems in terms of European security and Atlantic internationalism, if you like, that imbalance between America's needs and, and Europe's needs. Um, so that's part of why Wilson is not able to persuade the US Senate to enter the kind of League of Nations that he wants. And most of the peace settlement in 1919, as far as the British and French are concerned, depends on America's continued involvement in an alliance that has been an American alliance, an alliance with America that has been essential for the defeat of Germany. If you take America out of the equation, the peace is unenforceable. Britain and France are not in a position to do it alone. The British are very conscious of this uh, as a power that has been traditionally, if you like, isolationist about continental Europe, intervening where it's absolutely necessary, but pulling back wherever possible which leaves the French in a 
uh, a situation against Germany where they are trying to enforce a peace that they can't in terms of the balance of, of power and nations once Germany recovers. So it's not until 1945 that the Americans enter for the second time the process of European peacemaking, and this time with a physical presence right in the heart of Europe. It matters that the war in the West ends in 1918 with the German army still fighting outside its borders. <clears throat> um, and that, of course, is the source of, uh, of, is one of the reasons why Hitler and others on the right can play with the idea that Germany was robbed of its victory, that it was stabbed in the back in some way uh, by pacifists, leftists, Jews, whatever, who took the victory away. And that's also why Franklin Roosevelt is absolutely determined to have a policy of unconditional surrender this time in Germany, which means that you will fight all the way into to Berlin, you will conquer the whole of the country, you will occupy it, you will denazify it. And so, to go to your question about the US and the Soviet Union, while it is true in a large sense that 1917 marks the point where you have two ideologies in contestation, I would say it's still in potential contestation. Where it really matters is where two ideologies embodied in two armies are right in the heart of Europe, in Germany, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, and so on. And then the question is, can we withdraw? Do we withdraw? What will happen if we withdraw? Will the other side fill a power vacuum and so on? So I would say there's a fundamental difference between the legacy of the two world wars. The 1980 is the first step for America, but the second step matters even more, and it's wh that's when the confrontation becomes acute. Uh, and of course, it has an effect on Soviet policy as well partly because of that notion of the Soviet notion of security, that is part of why the, the, the idea of a physical buffer for the Soviet Union controlling the whole of Eastern Europe uh, takes a very firm and, and indelible shape. Well, I, I, I think that Professor Reynolds has given a very fair description of what uh, what has basically happened i i too do not believe that uh, that uh, wilson and americans entered the war with uh, moral or ideological uh, goals in mind i mean those uh, goals were kind of superimposed on on uh, 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 on the war as it neared uh, its end and as uh, the thinking started about the terms of armistice and uh, the terms of of post war post war resolution just the same uh, wilson as as a professor at princeton uh, 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 personally was influenced by the exceptionalist streak in 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 American foreign policy by by the city up on the hill uh, uh, metaphor that uh, helped to bring democracy and uh, and uh, peace and justice to uh, to to other nations on the margin. Uh, uh, the role of uh, uh, some of the Central European exiles in the United States, including Masaryk, was quite important in in lobbying uh, uh, lobbying uh, Wilson and uh, and uh, and the administration for uh, the post far uh, post war division of the Austrian Empire into the. Uh, new independent uh, states uh, as and 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 I emphatically agree uh, that it is impossible in this respect to compare the two world wars uh, i mean the uh, uh, the lesson of the first world war is not that all wars are bad the 
uh, lesson for me, the lesson of the First World War is that it was a mess, a catastrophe brought about uh, on uh, mankind and on Europeans without anyone really intending it to happen. I mean, the sleepwalkers metaphor, I think, is still, for me, still the best uh, 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 description of what happened in the First World War. The Second, first, what, the second World War was different. It was a war of, uh, uh, against a militant ideology uh, waged by uh, uh, an alliance of, uh, of countries that on the whole defended the uh, democratic ideals and, uh, and, uh, and independence of nation and, uh, and you know, civilized <laughs> principles, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, that also makes me believe that, uh, of course, we all believe in peace and motherhood. But uh, uh, as every diplomat knows, there are legitimate use of force. There are legitimate uses of force, and uh, and the Second World War, in in my thinking, was uh, you know one such uh, one such use. As for the uh, the October Revolution, I mean, in the old days, we were forced to call it the Great October Revolution. And we quipped that the only problem with it was that it was not a revolution, it was a coup. It did not happen in October, but in November, and it was not all that great. So, uh, 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 but uh, it came to us with a vengeance more than 20 years later. Uh, uh, the Czechs played a, a minor role during the uh, revolution in the form of the Czech legions, a little known story, but it is a fact, and there's now a new book about uh, the the story that for a time uh, the uh, Czech legions controlled something like 40% of the territory of Siberia, which is, uh, you know, incredible, but only attests to the well-known principle that whoever controls communications controls territory and the Czechs control the Trans-Siberian Railway and that's, that's how they, uh, they, they managed the, the trick. It came us in very good stead after the war as, uh, uh, as a prime example of the Czech contribution to the outcome of the war and, uh, and made also the independence of Czechoslovakia not only possible but welcome. Thank you. Uh, the f after the First World War, we had a big wave of democracy, de democratization, because all these new states were established as democracies. Um, I'm far away uh, to say that it came from America, because if you remember uh, the first um, Constitution influenced uh, by the Enlightenment with the division of power uh, was uh, in the end of the uh, 18th century in Poland. Um, but uh, in that concrete situation, in the end of the war, the Americans played an important role um, for that, bringing that European principle back uh, to Europe. And they played an important role for the whole century they failed to stay in the beginning, but after the Second World War, they stayed. So we see that you mentioned it, your country, Czechoslovakia at that time, was the only one besides Finland uh, who stayed until the war. The most of them developed to be authoritarian states. If we see the last wave of democratization, in the end of the century, in 1989, that uh, was very important that a lot of states became democracies. And we see today that in these states, sometimes the division of power, the independency of judiciary, for instance, is under pressure. Do you think a similarity in that? Is there 
what is the dangers for democracies seeing both developments in comparison? I'll have a fast go at, uh, at this. Again, it's very interesting from the perspective of uh, uh, historical legacies and uh, uh, heritages. Uh, there is a, a politologist and sociologist uh, at uh, the Harvard School, uh, the Center for European Studies of Polish uh, birth, Krzysztof Ekiat, and he has a series of very interesting uh, uh, papers and, and lectures in which he shows uh, the slides of the map of Poland uh, on various unrelated phenomena like uh, who voted for the uh, civic uh, uh, block and for the justice a party in the last election who took out a uh, uh, mortgage on his house in euros, the number of uh, volunteer uh, firemen companies. And, and then he shows the slides and, and then the slides overlap as basically one slide which shows a tripartite division of Poland uh, 150 years later. And, uh, and that's an effect of history. What I mean by this is that it's quite clear that the parts of the former empire that were on the Austrian side of the border, like Czechs, Austrians, part of Poland, uh, Silesia, and so on, had a better chance at developing functioning democracies than uh, the parts on the Hungarian uh, uh, side of the, of the um, empire. I'm sorry to say that, but descriptively, I think uh, you know, that is the case. And uh, that may have helped us and, and others in the first years after 1989, after we overthrew the first the 50 years of uh, totalitarian regimes uh, and started building democracies that there had been some history of, of, uh, of uh, democracy and rule of law and effective democratic institutions in, in our part of the empire. But I think that 30 years later, say 30 years later the effect has largely dissipated. I do not see uh, uh, that much of a contrast these days between uh, one part and the other. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so to perhaps go back to the First World War um, in a different way, um, you mentioned the wave of democratization. It's not just in Central and Eastern Europe. This is, after all, in Britain. This is the first time Britain really becomes a, a democracy in terms of voting when all adult males are given the vote and that's explicitly because they have died for their country uh, and the ones who survived should be allowed to vote for it. Uh, it's a fundamental change in the view of the electorate from simply saying, you know, the voters should be those who own property. Um, one gun, one vote was the slogan. And it also uh, passes over to women as well because of the role of women in the war economy uh, as what was known as Tommy's sister. Tommy was the slang for British soldiers. Tommy's sister were the people who were uh, producing the munitions uh, in the factories in Britain, the women who had taken on men's jobs and on the buses, the trains, whatever it is in the offices. Um, they ought to be rewarded as well. The problem when uh, you got down to it was actually the, um, the calculation by uh, elderly die-hard males that if you actually gave the vote to all of Tommy's sisters over the age of 21, women would be in a majority in the electorate uh, 
and that was thought of as being just too impossible to tolerate. So they came up with a more convoluted arrangement of essentially giving the vote to women over 30, and it took another 10 years um, to give uh, an egalitarian um, franchise. But my point is that democracy had an effect you know, much more generally. It obviously has in Germany, it has in, uh, in, in uh, the new independent countries, but it also has in Britain. Now, one of the things that I think is important in a, a small way about those um, democracies in the 1920s and 30s is that most of them are established on what you could call a French model, or perhaps a Belgian model in, in some cases, but that's taken from the French. In other words, that you uh, it's democracy with a strong assembly, a strong parliament in terms of powers, and a weak executive. And the consequence of that is frequently uh, coalitions, unstable coalitions of the sort that were, of course, uh, a, a factor in, uh, you know, a norm in the Fr Third Republic in France itself in the 20s and 30s. But it was this sense of unstable governments that actually was one factor in the appeal of a strong man in the 19, late 20s, early 30s, particularly, and we shouldn't forget this, in the context of a major economic disaster, the Great Depression. Uh, although we tend to think about the 20s and 30s as a block, what um, you know, has been rightly called the hinge years, the hinge between the 20s and the 30s, is 1929 to 1933, the slump, the Great Depression. Uh, uh, if you have a country with a quarter, a, a third of the workforce out of work, which was, of course, the case with Germany in the 1930s, early 1930s, uh, and was true of many of the countries of Eastern Europe, which were heavily dependent on uh, agriculture and, on the, and therefore were very badly hit by the collapse of food prices, if ordinary people are facing that kind of problems, it's not surprising they are uh, more attracted by the idea of a national savior, a strong man. Um, so it's a reminder to us that we can't just talk about politics. We have to think about this in relationship to economics. And one of the big factors in the 1920s and 30s is the economic collapse. By contrast, Certainly for Western Europe, after the Second World War, you have a long period from the you know, 40s uh, to the 70s of unprecedented economic growth and progress. And also, for many of the countries, I think, of, of Central and Eastern Europe, political repression and control is also accompanied by rapid economic change particularly the urbanization of countries that had been heavily agricultural, and the experience for many people of a situation where they actually have an apartment of their own, uh, where there are certain basic material rights which, or material benefits which had not been experienced before. And that is actually part of their own life experience as well, uh, accompanied by political control. So it seems to me that we have to keep that the economic experiences in mind as well as the political ones. Thank you. My last dimension I would like to raise um, is the question of international peace. Um, the powers after the uh, First World War uh, in, the, in Paris and their suburbs, um, it was the aim to establish an international order, uh, an order of peace. Um, and we know that they failed. But I think it is important to, to, uh, to look, have a look to that different dimensions in which way they tried. Um, on the one hand, uh, it is interesting to see that the losers were not invited. Uh, I think this is an interesting thing. Another thing I observe is that, for instance, in the um, peace order between Turks and Greeks, there was an understanding that um, harmonistic and 
uh, that how to say it, uh, homogene population could be a, a guarantee for peace. And even if you exchange the population, it's better for peace in the future. So they did what we call today ethnic cleansing with exchange of population in order to establish peace, which I think we would, wouldn't do it um, today. But on the other hand, it is very clear that there was established an international law and international institution, and they were, they were convinced that both is necessary in order to establish peace. Um, from that conviction which they had, uh, can we have a look to that? I think that would be important, Mr. Reynolds and then Michael. Well, first of all, I don't think it's uh, Europe we should be discussing first and foremost in this respect. I mean, uh, thanks to the fact that after the Second World War, the uh, uh, allies, the victorious powers, did not make uh, the same uh, mistake they made after the First World War and, and to one or another degree invited the losers to, to, to participate in the rebuilding of the continent. Europe has been now uh, largely peaceful for the last uh, uh, 70 years and even after 1989 no matter what anyone says about not inviting the uh, the Russians uh, to partake in the benefits of uh, uh, democracy and global economy I can't hear that language I, I think that most politicians I I know in Europe and over the pond uh, in North America have been bending over backwards to uh, to uh, have the Russians participate and invite them to all kinds of things. Uh, that they didn't is another is another is another thing. But the risks and threats to. Uh, international peace are not in Europe today. They are uh, in parts of the world that still live in the, not Westphalian, but pseudo-Westphalian arrangement like the large parts of the Middle East. Uh, you know, the countries that came into being after the uh, collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, were largely uh, the products of the sykes pico uh, uh, you know, agreement without having very strong historical uh, claims to a country status as a, either as a territory or as a population or, or as, a, as a monarchic dynasty. dynasty. And, and what we have today is the, is the rewards of, of that. You know, Iraq is a is a case in point, but it's not the only such country that uh, you know might benefit from from uh, from some redrawing of uh, uh, internal borders uh, uh, and so on. As for the population swaps, there's nothing you can say these days that would be politically correct. But uh, but I will that to say that if it's a choice between uh, mass scale massacres and swapping population, I'm in favor of swapping populations. Well, I'll just come at it from a slightly different angle and then because we want to open up the questions. Um, when I wrote this book called The Long Shadow about the Great War in the 20th century, one of the things that I was struck by was this sense that for all the countries involved in the war or not involved in the war, the two world wars were seen in interrelationship. Uh, so, for example, in my country, the First World War, as we were discussing earlier, is viewed as a, a kind of tragic and incomprehensible sacrifice, whatever the work of military historians. The Second World War is our finest hour, and we dwell on that. 
For the French, it's exactly the opposite. The, the First World War is an acceptable, noble sacrifice. The Second World War is still extraordinarily difficult for the French to talk about, about les années sombres and so on, you know. Um, and we can go on. But my point is this, that if you had lived through those two world wars, say as a soldier in the First World War, a junior officer, and then as a senior statesman in the Second World War, uh, which would be the case for somebody like Anthony Eden in Britain. Um, though that is a, a, an appalling experience. Uh, two conflicts in your lifetime. The first of them supposed to be the war to end wars. That was certainly the language in Britain. Demonstrably, it did not. That what you want to do after 1945 is to find a way of preventing a third of these conflicts, not least because that is likely in the nuclear age to be the last one. And what concerns me is that, well, so what came out of that was, I think, a wave of international institutions created in 19, after 1945, but in the light of those two conflicts, which were intended to build, to some degree, an international framework and an international spirit among countries that still operated as sovereign states on, a, if you like, a, a Westphalian principle. So we're talking about the United Nations, we're talking about the Universal Charter of Human Rights, we're talking about uh, the, uh, the GATT, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, because as I said, not repeating the depression of the 1930s is an important part of the story as well in their minds. We're talking, uh, to move on slightly, the European coal steel community, the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which for me is essentially the peace treaty to end World War II in the West. You know, France and Germany have beaten the hell out of each other for 300 years, and they have finally come to their senses and said, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. You know, 700 years, okay, so I, I'm, a, I'm a rather narrow historian. Um, but my point is that the, you can go on, you can map out a whole lot of other international institutions that were created. Most of those institutions now are contested, are under criticism, and if we're honest, are problematic. The European Union, for example, has expanded across the whole of Europe, but it has not adjusted to the implications of that in terms of management, in terms of, of, of you know, combining direction with democracy and so on. Uh, the UN is under criticism, it's embattled. Uh, you now have strong nationalist governments not least in the United States, which has been a principal bulwark of this. So one of, I think, one of the really big problems is that if you like the legacy of those two world wars in terms of creating a sense of internationalism, we've now, you know, it's now several generations away. And I don't get much of a sense from my own students uh, that they are passionate about and concerned about these sorts of things. And so it's an interesting issue. We are remembering a war, but I think we also need to be thinking about the larger legacies of internationalism that came out of that war and the other one as well. Thank you very much. Now we open the floor for the audience and you have the ability uh, to take part in the discussion. Who will start with it? Okay, we start here, then we go there. Okay. Who has the microphone now? Oh, is anybody? Should start. You should start okay. with the microphone. So here we go. My name is Gabriel Pola. I'm uh, Romanian, Romanian Australian. It doesn't really matter. 
I do freelance research into systemic corruption of European institutions. I have documentary proofs. I'm not going to ask the question about that. The question is this. You were talking about the finest hour of Britain at the end of the Second World War. But the thing is, the end of the Second World War, the way it ended, empowering Stalin, giving him the resources of, the th of a third of Europe to do his evil, continue his evil empire, that surely isn't the finest hour of Britain. So the question is this. When is Britain, when are the Allies going to stop living in denial, accept responsibility for the fact that they created the communist problem, they fed it? And when are they going to apologize for that? Simple question. Right, thank you. I'll give you a simple answer. First, basic misunderstanding of what I said. I said the British like to think about the Second World War as their finest hour. I don't believe it was, but that is the national mythology that it was. And it's mostly a concentration on a tiny bit of it, 1940. I entirely agree with you. The British do not think about most of the issues of the Second World War and most of its consequences. With regard to the question of uh, 1945 and Stalin, the essential decision that leaves Stalin in control of s most of Eastern Europe is the British unwillingness, inability to mount a second front earlier in the war. And the way that the Americans, who are mobilized late, go along with that decision. In other words, go along with Churchill's policy of trying to win control of the Mediterranean and, in his phrase, close the ring on Germany. The implication of that, given the slowness of the campaign in North Africa and Italy, is that if the Red Army defeat the Wehrmacht, which is not uh, an obvious uh, conclusion to draw in, say, November 1942, before the Battle of Stalingrad is decided, if the Red Army defeats the Wehrmacht and comes back a thousand miles to Berlin, Stalin will be in control of Eastern Europe. What the British and the Americans do at Yalta is simply to acknowledge the fact of the Red Army's presence in Eastern Europe. There is nothing they can do to change that basic fact. So the issue is not about the diplomacy of the war, it's about the military strategy of the war. For two countries that mobilized late, did not have large armies, and had a democ democratic population that were averse to the kind of massive casualties that Stalin was willing to accept in order for the Red Army to advance across Eastern Europe. I'm not clear whether that requires an apology. I think first it needs some understanding of the particular national predicaments of particular countries. Uh, but I would say that is my interpretation of it, not that this was a deliberate policy on the part of the British government. Uh, well, I'm not a great believer in, in finest hours uh, in the history of, of, of any nation, but uh, I would probably, as someone born in a country that was divided right into the middle by the Soviet and Allied forces when they came to liberate it from the East and from the West, I would have to defend uh, Britain and, and, and the Allies. I mean, by the time it happened in 1945, it was simply a question of the balance of forces. If uh, uh, the Allies chose to fight Stalin in May 1945, they would have probably 
lost or they would have had to fight a nuclear war in the center of Europe which would uh, uh, not be uh, a better outcome for <laughs> people in my country at least. So uh, and it's, it's how the war went and, and I think no apologies should be required. Yes, thank you very much, Anne Dighton, University of Oxford. Um, thank you for those very good overviews. It was beautifully put together. I have one quick observation and then a question which is driven by curiosity about the present day. Uh, my observation uh, is addressed to you, Michael, if I may. And uh, you said that the United States came into the Second World War on a matter of morals, morali morality and principle. Um, I'm just curious as to why they waited till 1941, if that was the case. That's my observation. Uh, my questions relate to the contemporary period and the way we can look at it as historians. Uh, my question for Professor Reynolds is that if the United States, when it engages in foreign policy, takes the city on the hill, the moral ground, the idealistic approach, in part to mask the differences that exist within the United States. Um, do you think that President Trump is up to making that kind of intervention on the part of the Western community and Western institutions about which you spoke so eloquently? Uh, my question for Michael is one out of ignorance. I'm very curious to know how settled are the borders in this region now? We keep going back to borders, but how settled are they today? Thank you very much. Uh, first, a short comment on, on your observation. I mean, obviously, you have a point, but uh, it's also very difficult to get the United States Congress to vote for war under any circumstances. And by the time the United States entered the war after Pearl Harbor, I mean, they definitely took sides with the British and, uh, uh, and uh, against uh, the Nazis in, in the land lease, in, in uh, uh, helping uh, the British with armaments and supplies. So uh, I, I don't think they were neutral by the time they entered uh, the war, but uh, they only entered the war in, in, in 1941, you're right. Uh, as for the borders, uh, well, I'm hard put to think of any, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, of any border issue, outstanding border issue in, in, in Central Europe, certainly not with my country, not with Germany, uh, not with Poland, I hope I'm right, uh, 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 not with Slovakia, uh, not with Hungary, not even with Hungary. I mean, there is some talk about uh, you know, the rights of Hungarians living outside Hungary that appears in the political discourse, but but no question of borders of, or a change of borders that, that I'm aware of. Yeah, just to follow up on that, if you think of the, the huge ruptures in Europe over the course of the last 100 years, 1918, 1945, 1989, 91, the first two of those came about through massive conflicts and huge debate about borders and, minor and movement of peoples and so on. Uh, the vendor, the, you know, the, the events of 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union, though huge upheavals, and we have talked about the question of, you know, how rooted is democracy, came about relatively peacefully. 
and in a way which has been historically most unusual, despite all the problems that you might discern still. With regard to the question I was asked, um, um, there was a book I think written some years ago, uh, I've forgotten the author, Michael Hunt possibly, but it was about American foreign policy and it was, it was about the question of mobilizing consent. Mobilizing consent for foreign policy and particularly for going to war in a country that was mostly 3,000 miles away from any of these wars. Now asking for any government, unless you're operating a system of, of conscription and, and, and fairly brutal conscription, which was the case for most of the powers in, on the continent in, in 1914, but nowadays, or in more, more modern times, mobilizing consent in a democracy is actually a huge task. It's a bigger task in America, asking people to fight and die. And it seems to me it's quite natural to go on to the moral plane, which is what I said Wilson did. It's certainly what Roosevelt did. Roosevelt had a strong sense of trying to explain to Americans why their national interest was different in the age of air power, where he said the, you know, the Atlantic is no longer a barrier. But also he wanted to put it on a moral plane. And I think that's, um, that's particularly the case for Americans. Um, as to Trump, I, I am really not a specialist in the kind of psychology that would be necessary to understand Mr. Trump. But let me say this, um, what we're seeing now, to go back to the comment I made earlier, is the passing of, if you like, an Atlanticist generation or generations in the United States. In other words, uh, political and foreign policy leaders whose instinct growing out of the experiences of the war and the early Cold War was that the security of Europe, by which at that stage they meant Western Europe, was really bound up with America's interests and values. They looked east, if you like, across the Atlantic. Obama was a kind of transitional figure, a man who still bought into that officially, but he hadn't got the same gut feeling about it. Trump, I think, is a different kind of figure, and it's not accidental that, of course, the State Department is one of the agencies in the American government which has been least filled with people in the Trump administration, partly because he doesn't believe in diplomacy, but also because they're the kind of people who would tend to think in those Atlanticist terms. So it seems to me that the kind of pattern, the larger patterns of American diplomacy have not just, you know, Trump is, as it were, uh, uh, the, the sign of some deeper changes that have been going on in America and its whole orientation in recent years. Uh, one sentence uh, uh, remark, uh, John Bolton, who's been brought into the White House as the National Security Advisor recently, uh, is a very atypical uh, diplomat and is sometimes a very difficult man to deal with but he is a committed Atlanticist. Uh, I have comments to, to two issues. Um, first, um, to, to the, the question of Yalta agreement. So I basically agree that there was not much to do uh, in 1945 with uh, Central Europe. So unless the, 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 the big powers, Western powers would decide to go into another war, which was very difficult for various reasons, military, but also the, 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 the problem of propaganda, that for a couple of years they, they promoted pro-Russian or pro-Soviet propaganda, and then it was very difficult within a couple of weeks to, to, to turn it uh, into another thing. But, but, but actually, what would, uh, I, I would say that even the, 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 the letter, uh, the, the, uh, even the, uh, letter of the Yalta agreement was not observed by the Western powers. So they at least could protest when the, the free elections were broken, when the, because we were, had promised the, the free election and it was, didn't happen. The, uh, the, the uh, uh, exile government in, in London was betrayed, so the people were uh, you know, put aside. The, the Polish uh, uh, troops who, which fight, fought uh, from September 1949 until uh, May 
1945 uh, were betrayed, and so on. This is this this was this is a very sad story. And uh, second, um, to the the border issue, there there are no border issues now in in the region, but the 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 the, the problem that 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 we see from our perspective is Ukraine. I mean, the, for the first time after 1945. The, 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 the border, uh, the borders that were uh, 1945, more or less borders, that were uh, broken by force. And this is very bad example, and this, is, uh, and this also forges extremist movements across all Europe. And also the Russians sponsor uh, extremist movements. So I wouldn't be, uh, okay, for now, we, 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 we have been, we could, should not exaggerate, but we, sh we, we should have in mind that the, 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 the uh, propaganda uh, and, and uh, some consequences of the Ukrainian war are very dangerous for Europe uh, in, in the view of, of uh, borders. Thank you, yes. Well, I think I agree that the Yalta conference was a situation where on the Polish question, the, both Roosevelt and Churchill went to the conference recognizing that most of the issues in their view had been decided by force. Roosevelt spoke to senators before he, he, he journeyed to Yalta and he was asked a lot about Poland and he said, all I can do is try and ameliorate the situation. Ameliorate it, make it a bit better. Um, what was, and afterwards, when he came back, he was asked by his chief of staff, Bill Leahy, who looked at the agreement on Poland, and he said, Mr. President, this is just hugely elastic. It, the words can be interpreted in any way. And Roosevelt looked at him and he said, Bill, this is the best I can do for Poland at the moment. Um, which, of course, is a reminder that A, Roosevelt didn't expect to die, though many other people did, and B, that Yalta was not intended to be the last word on the whole situation. Um, if you take the British point of situation, this is another example of, of as it were, po foreign policy by cock-up. Um, uh, the British decided not to guarantee Czechoslovakia in 1938, which in a lot of ways would have been a, a better position to take, morally and also militarily. Uh, Chamberlain did not do that, Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister. He put his faith in an agreement with Hitler. Hitler broke that agreement in March 39, and there was then panic in London over a weekend. And it was a situation of, now we have to do something. What can we do? Are we going to guarantee all these other countries, hopefully uh, their independence, as a, a deterrent to Hitler? So, you know, guarantee to Greece, guarantee to Poland, did the British have any intention or ability to fight for those countries? No, they had a, you know, they'd only just started conscription. This was intended to be a kind of, you know, a warning to Hitler far too late. For Churchill, the whole of the Second World War, no, that's not true. From 1941, yeah, from 1941 onwards, how he is going to honor that if you like, almost impossible promise to Poland is a real preoccupation. And he wrestles with it endlessly. I've just finished editing a, a book of, of Churchill and Roosevelt's correspondence with Stalin, and a huge amount of this is actually about Poland. And, uh, you know, Churchill is a man for whom the word duty is very strong. And he spends a lot of time trying to solve a problem which is essentially insoluble, partly because the London government is, a, is a, a group of factions that don't agree on what they want to do, but also because 
the territorial issue has been is 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 disappearing because of the move of the Red Army. And then, of course, his hopes that Stalin will entertain some kind of pluralist coalition are, are utopian and impossible. The other thing to say, just apropos of this question, well, you know, war, you couldn't have turned around three weeks after the end of war uh, 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 and, and fought the Russians. Actually, Churchill does think about that. Uh, on the, so victory day is the 8th or the 9th of May, depending on whether you're Britain or Russian. Um, 18th of May, Churchill asks the chief of staff what would be involved if the British and the Americans embarked on a war against the Soviet Union to try and get a square deal for Poland. In other words, to enforce this Yalta agreement. And part of that uh, scenario is that it would involve rearming Germans. So, I mean, this, the chiefs of staff are absolutely incredulous at this. Two week, less than two weeks after victory, you're talking about fighting your ally and rearming your enemy. And they call it Operation Unthinkable. But the war plan is there in the National Archives. They point out that the, this idea of fighting the, the, the Russians had been tried before in the recent past, very recent past, and indeed uh, a particular army had got to the edge of Moscow and had got deep into the Caucasus. And by the end of the war, it, that army had been completely destroyed in the ruins of Berlin. Churchill looks at this plan and he comes to his senses and he says, okay, we put this in the archives. I have never understood this. I, I put it down on the one hand, why Churchill did this, I put it on the one hand down to his genuine sense of anguished impotence about Poland, and also to the situation of a man who is absolutely worn out by five years of warfare. It is totally irrational, but it's an irrationality that has a certain bizarre rationality as well. But it reminds me again, and this is relevant to all these questions, you know, the, the pressures on people of making decisions in any kind of high level, particularly in a time of war, um, and what it's easy for us now to second guess what they should have done. Um, I think the history of diplomacy and the history of politics is a history of mistakes, and really basically what we're talking about is, you know, some mistakes are you know, more disastrous than others. That's a long answer to your question, but there we are. Thank you very much. I think especially these last sentences um, are very important uh, for us dealing with past in a political framework. Um, we usually would like uh, to have the right decision backwards. Um, and we know usually that uh, in former times we would have done the right decisions. But there is some reason for doubts. Um, and so, uh, I think we have learned in this discussion that the world, even in that time, is not black or white. It is much more uh, complicated. And uh, in the time who, which came afterwards, uh, we got uh, communism in a lot of European countries and um, with all these problems um, and the end of the Cold War and our challenges of today, which are not so easy as we wanted um, to be. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, um, for that very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, thank you, all of you, for participation. Um, and I don't know what the steering committee has done because I closed my session my uh, panel, um, but I will ask the steering committee and especially um, the member of Romania who is our host, um, if he, he would like to say something. If not, Florin, then I would like to thank you uh, and your team um, for uh, hosting us. Uh, it was very good to be here. <coughs> I would like to thank the staff uh, 
of European network. They did a really marvelous job. Thank you very much, all of you. <laughs>